So what I want to do today is read to you a bit from an article I published recently in the Harbinger, the Journal for Social Ecology. And it's entitled, Jordan Peterson, Carl Jung, and the Challenge for Social Ecology. I don't take a position for social ecology necessarily, nor do I take a position for Jordan Peterson. What I'm trying to do in the article though is I do provide a critique of Peterson. I also provide to a certain extent through dialogue with Carl Jung and social ecology, a critique of social ecology. What I wanted to do was to provide a lot of people with some food for thought. So you can go to the article, read the whole thing, please do. Um, I'll put a link below. Uh, but what I wanted to do was read to you the part that I thought maybe uh, would provide the most new information. And that has to do with the political thought of Carl Jung and how it's read through uh, Charles Taylor, through Jordan Peterson, etc. So reading Jung through a philosopher like Charles Taylor is useful for many reasons, but one of them is that it demonstrates that Jung's insights are not entirely unique. The same kind of observation about the loss of enchantment due to the rise of Enlightenment rationalism is made by thinkers as varied as Friedrich Nietzsche, Isaiah Berlin, Leo Strauss, Jacques Ellul, Eric Vogelin, and Hans Morgenthau, and none of these figures are considered leading contributors to New Age superstition. Rather, they deal with a very important shift in the consciousness of human beings in modernity, a shift with important implications for how we organize ourselves and how we interact with our environment. Jung's speculation that the archetypes are somehow biologically embedded is what makes his argument or his particular rendition of this general theory unique but the field of comparative mythology certainly backs up Jung's core observation that there are ideas such as creation, flood, destruction of the earth, the birth and death of gods, etc., that are universal but get expressed differently in different cultures. Reading Jung through Taylor also highlights the overlap of Jung's concerns with those of Bookchin. Like Freud, who sought the origins of human neuroses in our primal experiences, Jung tried very hard to get into the minds of archaic human beings just as Taylor does. None of these authors reduce primitive experience to what scientifically informed people think of it. Now, instead, they attempt to enter the mental emotional space in which archaic peoples lived. Bookchin makes a similarly concerted effort to get into the minds of those peoples and like Freud, Jung, and Taylor uses the findings of philosophers, anthropologists, and archaeologists to do so. We might say that what Bookchin saw as one of mankind's biggest misfortunes is what Taylor characterized as disembeddedness. For Taylor, becoming disembedded from a social oneness was intimately tied to slow disenchantment starting around the axial age and reaching a crucial point during the Enlightenment and beyond. So unlike Bookchin, for Jung and Taylor, the loss of direct spiritual experience, let's see, do I have Charles Taylor? Yes. Um, the loss of direct spiritual experience is connected to the loss of social oneness. As this loss becomes increasingly severe, in Taylor's language, the police state begins to emerge. At first, the stronger state works to make people better religionists, but eventually people figure out that their methods for creating social order work without religious goals as primary and the race for social and environmental engineering is on. Jung theorized that the psychic energy that once was directed at non-human targets, namely gods or God, is at this point transferred to organizations created by human beings and to leaders and ideologies. Because of modern empiricism and rationalism, the sort of un seemingly unstoppable mechanization of life that Jacques Ellul referred to as technique, um, and the growing disbelief in anything superior to mundane human experience, people are alienated from nature and life. Their cultures are degraded and destroyed with the destruction of the symbolic, that is the irrational side of life. They are in turn much more susceptible to psychic inflation attributing to themselves godlike capabilities and importance. More frequently, 
They are susceptible to identification with ideologies, the state, or godlike leaders. This is what Jung thought accounted for the catastrophes of World War I and World War II. Jung argued that traditional religion was psychologically superior to secular ideological belief systems and that ideologies were more dangerous to society, individual life, and freedom than religion. He diagnosed the crisis of our times by pointing out the totalitarian political structures of the 20th century were born in a rebellious denial of the religious instinct in man, and that this is not mere coincidence. This connection between religion and ideology and the implication that religion is superior to ideology and with the further implication that we might be able to learn from religion, this is jarring to some modern ears, but we need to remember that Jung was grappling with the immediate and unprecedented phenomenon of fascism, Nazism, and then totalitarian communism. What was wrong with German life before and between the two wars that simulated the archetypes of rage and led to Nazism? What disturbed people so deeply that they instinctually found sociopathic figures who personified their rage? Jung emphasized two related causes in his essay After the Catastrophe. While, and while he discussed the humiliation of World War I, for the Germans, neither of his chief points centered on it. The first point on which Jordan Peterson does not dwell was the urbanization and massification of people as a cause of ideological extremism. The second was the rise of the large dominating modern state that followed urbanization and massification. The first issue he described this way. This is Jung. As I have said, the uprush of mass instincts was symptomatic of a compensatory move of the unconscious. Such a move was possible because the conscious state of the people had become estranged from the natural laws of human existence. Thanks to industrialization, large portions of the population were uprooted and were herded together in large centers. This new form of existence with its mass psychology and social dependence on the fluctuations of markets and wages produced an individual who was unstable, insecure, and suggestible. He was aware that his life depended on boards of directors and captains of industry. And he supposed, rightly or wrongly, that they were chiefly motivated by financial interests. He knew that no matter how conscientiously he worked, he could still fall a victim at any moment to economic changes which were utterly beyond his control and there was nothing else for him to rely on. Again, that was Carl Jung. Jung credits the uprooting of people by the Industrial Revolution, which had continued apace up to and through the First World War and interwar years with creating a new kind of person, a mass man. There are two reasons why industrial urbanization had this effect. The sheer numbers of people working and living so closely together created a dehumanizing herd mentality in which the individual felt lost in the crowd. Such a person could feel as though his insignificance and anonymity meant that he had little moral responsibility. What was lost during the process of urbanization is significant and remains largely uncompensated. Jung argued that people experienced more solitude in rural life and were forced to remain aware of their individuality and moral agency. They experienced directly the fruits of their labor if they worked on farms or were craftsmen, work that also reminded them of their individuality and moral agency. They dealt with relatively few people, among which their families and relatives loomed large, so their community bonds were naturally stronger. They created real relationships with their neighbors as well, which they saw, which because they saw each other frequently and naturally cared for each other's needs. In these small ways, they were known and could know others and themselves. Taylor explains that rural people could also more easily experience the fearsome and primal forces of nature especially the mystery and danger of the wilderness as spiritual forces. As human beings began to conquer nature, as they envisioned themselves controlling and manipulating what was once wild, they lost direct access to numinous experience. 
out of this shift came a new understanding of God, what Taylor calls providential deism, and a new understanding of humanity in exclusive humanism. So not only did the masses lose individuality and real social connectedness, but they lost a feeling of direct contact with the divine. For Jung, this sense of direct contact was a central element in retaining a sense of individual balance and responsibility. Jung observed that the material rewards to be had in urban areas through working for wages were precarious in new ways, whereas in a pre-industrial setting, a peasant's livelihood might have been affected by the wilderness as in an act of God or a drought or flood. In the post-industrial urban environment, a worker's livelihood was affected by the actions of other people he or she would never see. Worse yet, it was affected by a mechanism beyond her or seemingly anyone's control, the market. In the liberal formulation, the market was not the product of planning or any ethical intention. Further, to the extent that governments intervened in the economy, and they most certainly did in all the economic systems Jung knew about at the time, they did not do so in the interests of individuals, families, or groups, but rather abstract economic growth was in mind. All of this added up to a great dehumanization with severe social and political consequences. Jung's observations on the major changes in lifestyle and mentality between agrarian and urban life are not addressed by Jordan Peterson, probably because they point uncomfortably to the development of capitalism as the underlying reason for the 20th century ideological extremism. In this regard, they are closer to the concerns of Bookchin or Marx's observation almost a century earlier that capitalism has resolved personal worth into exchange value and in place of the numberless indefeasible chartered freedoms has set up that single unconscionable freedom, free trade. That was a quote from Marx. Jung observed that liberal rhetoric to the contrary, free trade in the 20th century was not so free. Of course, the Nazis and the fascists practiced corporatism and the Russians communism, but the Americans and Western Europeans were also creating something other than a free market. Jung wrote, quote, the steady growth of the welfare state is no doubt a very fine thing from one point of view, but from another, it is, is it a doubtful blessing as it robs people of their individual responsibility and turns them into infants and sheep. In the 20th, 21st century, we need not think of the welfare state as referring simply to social welfare programs, but the tendency of the state to interfere more and more in the economy generally and in regulating, planning, and organizing many areas of life, such as banking and finance, economic development, farming and food, education and healthcare, all in the name of human welfare and a certain type of consumer freedom. As people in liberal countries became more, in, more dependent upon government for solutions of all kinds, they too participated in a kind of ideological possession. Carl Jung wrote of, quote, the accumulation of urban industrialized masses of people torn from the soil, engaged in one-sided employment and lacking every healthy instinct even that of self-preservation. Loss of the instinct of self-preservation can be measured in terms of dependence on the state, which is a bad symptom. Dependence on the state means that everybody relies on everybody else, that is the state, instead of on himself. Charles Taylor describes the deficit that produces ideological possession this way, quote, exclusive humanism tended to draw the compass of human life too narrowly pursuing the goods of life and prosperity while eschewing enthusiasm in a world designed especially to favor these ends seemed to make life shallow, devoid of deep resonance and meaning. It seemed to exclude transports of devotion, of self-giving, to deny a heroic dimension to our existence. It reduces us by enclosing us in a too rosy picture of the human condition, shorn of tragedy, irreparable loss, meaningless suffering, cruelty, and horror. In other words, this is me again, the price of industrialization, technological civilization, 
was a deadening of the spiritual senses and a diminishment of the feeling of being alive. The social, cultural, and economic forces that caused this dehumanization and that subsequently caused people to throw themselves into mass ideological upheavals as a means of compensation are still with us today and have only become stronger and more per pervasive. These forces include materialism, scientism, technical rationality, and automation. Since 1946, the rural-urban dynamic Jung discussed has also gotten much worse. Especially in America, we have seen the virtual destruction of the independent family farm, small towns and small businesses, places of worship, cultural practices and traditions. We have witnessed the destruction of a relatively independent rural way of life. Existing small Midwestern towns linger in a sort of half-dead state, having lost many families who have lived for generations on their land. Due partly, no doubt, to boredom and lack of a sense of clear purpose, alcohol and drug addiction are rampant. Rural people often lack access to de decent medical care, not to mention nutritious food. Ironically, rural and inner city areas are plagued by similar problems. Both areas treated by the rest of society as the, de the detritus left behind by economic progress, something to sweep under the rug. In the 1970s, Wendell Berry foresaw the consequences of this great upheaval. In the 1970s, Wendell Berry foresaw the consequences of this great upheaval, comparing what happened to white rural communities to the fate of Native Americans, the quote, conquerors, bringing a seemingly ineluctable, destructive social growth, or I should say commercial growth. Quote from Wendell Berry, time after time, in place after place, these conquerors have fragmented and demolished traditional communities, the beginnings of domestic cultures. They have always said that what they destroyed was outdated, provincial and contemptible and with alarming frequency, they have been believed and trusted by their victims. This is me again. Jung's views resonate with Barry's lament. As the Western world modernized, moving away from agrarian life and towards urbanization and industrialization, the reality was the destruction of traditional means of independence and spiritual disintegration. This is a very different story from the one Jordan Peterson offers. Peterson narrows the Jungian perspective to a Cold War anti-communist lens long after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But in Jung's story, the problem is not limited to totalitarian communism. It does not lie in the political left, but in modernity's origins in the scientific revolution, the enlightenment and the urbanization and industrialization that undergird the capitalist system. From this vantage point, the corporate government nexus of neoliberal capitalism would be for Jung just as problematic as communism. So that's the end of that section. Thanks for listening. Not the typical talk I give, but I wanted people to at least get a little bit of the taste of this article and hopefully you'll read the rest of it at the link below. Oh, next time I will be delving into Walter Brueggemann's The Prophetic Imagination, just in time for the holiday season.